sit down with Dr. Hossein Borgai, who is the Chief of the Division of Thoracic Medical Oncology and Associate Professor in the Department of Hematology Oncology at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Borgai. Thank you. So you are uh, the lead author of the Checkmate 227 trial. Um, can you just give us some background on Checkmate 227 and uh, what's the importance of, of a trial like this, creating a trial like this? Sure, just a slight co uh, correction. The, um, the original data for 227 was presented at ACR with Dr. Hellman, so he is the first author and presenting an updated data for 227. So this is a very large uh, randomized phase three study in patients with a newly diagnosed lung cancer, treatment naive, and regardless of the uh, uh, histology uh, and based on the level of PDL1 expression, patients are randomized to two different arms of the study. Patients that are PDL1 positive, and that's defined as 1% threshold, uh, are randomized in a one to one to one fashion to a PNEVO chemotherapy versus uh, AP and chemo. And then on the, in the PDL1 negative group, uh, again, less than 1% or negative, patients are randomized to. Um, either NEVO plus chemo, epinevo, or chemotherapy. Uh, and the overall goal of this study is overall survival. And as we heard from Dr. Hellman at the ACR and now published in New England Journal of Medicine, a subset of patients, those uh, uh, defined as having high tumor mutational burden, um, uh, had a better PFS with the combination of a P and NEVO compared to patients who got chemotherapy. And um, that established the role of um, uh, tumor mutational burden as a potential biomarker, and it shows the clinical efficacy of choosing patients based on yet another biomarker. And again, the, the difference there was seen across histologies and across the level of PDL1 when it came to selecting based on TMB. So it's an exciting data, but you know, we're all waiting for the additional data to come out of that study, including uh, additional PFS data for the PDL1 negative group comparing uh, uh, chemo and NEVO to chemotherapy, and then eventually the overall survival of these patients. So um, I think in the context of everything else that we've seen so far, uh, Checkmate 227 provides yet another option and potentially a new biomarker. Uh, and I say potentially because I think I, I do think we have to do some additional work uh, for patients with uh, treatment naive non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so exciting data, more to come. Definitely, you made some really great points. So we have heard a lot about I am Power 150 and I am Power 131. Right. Can you give us some background on those studies? Sure, absolutely. So. Uh, Empower, or Empower 150 is a study that actually um, was another large randomized phase three study with three different arms uh, where patients with, again, a treatment naive, non squamous histology were assigned to three different arms of the study. One was standard um, carboplatin, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab. Uh, the other arm was the same backbone, but uh, atezolizumab was grafted on it. And then the third arm was carboplatin, paclitaxel, and atezolizumab. The study has been presented a couple of times already, and I think we're going to get additional data here. Um, but it represents yet another improvement in what we've been doing with patient populations that uh, we see in the clinic. So the study concentrated on the non squamous histology. It brings in a, a regimen and a backbone that's been uh, in clinical practice for quite some time. Again, carboplatin, paclitaxel, bevacizumab. We know the efficacy of the regimen. Now we graft the tazolizumab on it. And what we saw so far and what we've seen so far suggests that uh, PFS is definitely better with the quadruple therapy. This is another study that's ongoing. We're gonna get additional data coming from the other arms of the study and the overall survival for the study. Um, but I think again, uh, if you look at the, the Empower 150 and some of the other studies that have been done uh, in the area of chemo plus IO, the, the, the broad message is that the addition of uh, either an anti-PD-1 or PDL one to establish chemotherapy backbone can improve clinical efficacy. Obviously, we want to see the survival data uh, like we've seen with some of the other trials, but still plays a significant role. And, and, and I think the message is that doing platinum doublet chemo alone is no longer an option. I think we do have to adjust our practices. Now, are the differences between the, the chemo backbones and things like that, those are the kind of really good scientific questions that we should sort of have to look into it. But as it stands not, right now, the significant thing is we're done with the platinum doublet alone, and we should consider adding uh, a, a, an IO agent to it. Same thing with the 131. So the 150 is a non-squamous histology. 131 
takes another back one commonly used, carboplatin, and either NAP, acetaxel, acetaxel, and adds a tazolizumab to it. So again, commonly used chemo backbone for the squamous cell population, which again, if you remember, we haven't made a lot of progress in that area in terms of targeted therapy. So having an additional treatment option that actually improves um, clinically significant endpoints like PFS response rate overall survival is significant. So the overall message again is, even for patients with squamous cell histology now, we have a treatment option that works better than just a platinum doublet. And then if you look at all of these studies, and again, 150 plus the 131, even though we added another agent, the toxicities, yes, they were higher. I mean, clearly, every time you add a new drug to you know, another combination, you anticipate getting a little bit more toxicity, but the toxicities were by and large manageable. There wasn't any new safety signal that came out of any of these studies, and the toxicities are in line with what we've seen with either chemotherapy or IO. So again, hopeful message that we are making progress in, in our, uh, in our uh, fight against this uh, metastatic lung cancer, and we're getting to a place where we actually are seeing much better survivals and PFS and response rate with these new combinations. Definitely. And we saw a couple of abstracts looking at pembrolizumab as monotherapy right. and in combination with chemotherapy. Can you just give a real quick snapshot of, of uh, those trials as well? So um, that is a little bit more complicated in that there are nuances in every study, obviously, and the studies were just presented, and we'll see what the publication and all that is. But um, the, the, one of the key studies that was presented in the plenary session today uh, suggested that anybody with greater than 1% pd one expression can benefit from pembrolizumab alone versus chemotherapy. If you really look at the data a little bit more carefully, and as it was presented by the discussant uh, at, at the end of the session, that benefit seems to be driven by patients with really high pdl one expression, which is the kind of um, study that we knew from before. Keynote 24 had shown that in a patient with a 50% uh, pdl one expression, single agent pembro is better than chemotherapy. And I think this study really does confirm that, but again, it gives us another option. If somebody comes to the door and they're not a good candidate for chemotherapy or Quite frankly, if a patient comes and says, and I don't want any chemotherapy, and I have seen those patients in my clinic, then we have a comfort level to say, okay, single agent pembroke can be affected in that setting. So the other studies, again, uh, chemo combination with, um, with pembrolizumab confirms what we just talked about. No longer is a platinum doublet alone for either the squamous cell histology or the non-squamous histology acceptable as a standard. What we have to do, and I think our job is, we have to identify who are the patients who really truly need to get chemo plus IO, who are the patients who maybe we can just start with IO alone, and at the other end of it, who are the patients who should really get chemotherapy and then maybe in a second line setting. So that's something that I think we're gonna to have to uh, differentiate as we go through all of the studies once everything is said and done to try to figure out how to uh, divvy up the patients within all of these groups. Right, right. And now last but not least, we have uh, docamitinib in the Archer 1050 trial. Right. So what do you make of, of those findings? Well, I think the biggest question is, is this going to be practice changing? And to me, I have to say no, because I feel that for patients with an EGFR mutated and non-small cell lung cancer, we have a really good sort of accepted standard of care in osimertinib. I know that we don't have really head-to-head -head comparisons and all that, but when you look at the totality of the data, osimertinib appears to be a little bit better tolerated. Um, I like the CNS activity of osimertinib. And again, I'm not saying that dacamatinib cannot be a good drug. It's just that based on everything we've seen from osimertinib, for me, that is the standard of care for patients who are identified as having an EGFR mutated lung cancer. I think I like the safety profile of osimertinib a little bit better than dacamatinib. Important study, yes, another EGFR a targeted uh, drug, more options is always good, but for me, it doesn't change my practice. Right, well, thank you, Dr. Borgai, for You're being welcome. here with us today. Really thank appreciate you. it. You're welcome.